Hey everyone, welcome back to another week here on the Foundry Church YouTube channel. We're so excited that you guys came to see what God is doing in and through his church. If you're looking to stay more connected with us throughout the week, the best way to do that is go to our Facebook page and like us. That way you can see our posts throughout the week as well as these YouTube videos. And speaking of that, if you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and do so. Now with that said, let's get into this week's message. Hey Foundry friends, my name's Eric Peterson. I'm the campus pastor out at Foundry West. It's so good to be able to share God's word with you this morning. Uh, if you're new to us, you may not know that we are one church that meets in multiple locations. And the campus that I teach at um, and, and, and serve at is out on the campus of Benjamin's Hope, which is on the north side of Holland. We'd love to have you come visit us out there sometime at 1030 on Sunday mornings. So wherever you're hearing this message from, uh, a warm greeting to you. Uh, I'm actually going to start with a story this morning. One of the reasons that I'm going to share a story is, well, a few reasons. Uh, Eric loves this story, so I'm kind of pandering to Eric. Uh, that's one reason. Uh, the second reason is it shows the power of transformation in a human life. Uh, one of our core values here at the Foundry is transformation. And uh, I'm a different person than I was 28 years ago when this story happened. I was 20 years old, um, so that's the second reason. The third reason is when I was young, when I was a young person, uh, the only sermons that I listened to were the ones that had a story in it. I was like, I just stopped listening if there was no story. And then the last reason is it's a fishing story. So uh, we're going to talk about a fishing story from the Bible here in a few minutes, but this is a fishing story of mine from when I was 20 years old. So um, show of hands, anybody ever get kicked out of one of the 50 U.S. states and asked to never return for the rest of your life? Anyone? Oh, I'm the only one. Okay. Oh, there's somebody in the back that has their hand up. Okay. Oh, wow, you're kicked out of the whole nation of Canada. Okay, wow, that trumps me. But I do, I do have a story about me getting kicked out of a U.S. state. So I'm going to share just a little bit about that. My group of friends in college was all from the East Coast. So I went to Calvin College, go Knights. Uh, I had uh, this group of friends that were all from New Jersey, the New Jersey area. They all went to the same school in New Jersey, East, Eastern Christian School. And when I started at Calvin, I kind of got hooked up with these guys, and they become, became my group of friends. And so the summer between sophomore and junior year at, at Calvin, um, they came up for the weekend. I was living in Boston for the summer with one of them. He had moved from New Jersey to Boston with his family, and I spent the summer living with him. I was painting houses, things like that. So we, were, we had a plan to, to hang out for that weekend. So four or five of these guys came up. Actually, Allison Elders uh, from the Foundry Church, her brother, uh, he was one of my best friends. Jeff, he was one of the guys on this trip too. Um, we were buddies from college. So they came up, and we did something that we used to call an ANTL. This is like excellent thinking. An A-N-T-L was an act now, think later plan. So that's a, it's a great plan in your youth, not really at all. But that's what we used to do. We we're like, let's do something. We'll just do it, but we'll think about it later. So the plan was, let's go camping. Let's throw all the camping gear in the car and the fishing gear. So this is a fishing story. And let's go up to Vermont and we'll find somewhere to camp up in Vermont. So earlier that summer with, um, with this family I was living with, they, we had camped with them up in Vermont at a campground. We're like, oh, we could just go back to that same campground. That'll be great. So we got in the car. We went, and we, f we got to that campground, and um, no vacancy at the campground. So we couldn't camp there. So we checked out kind of a, a couple other places, uh, couldn't camp there. And so we were like, okay, act now, think later, right? So we just said, let's just go down um, like some country dirt road and just find some land to camp on. So that was our plan. Like we'll just like, this, there's woods there and there's a stream there and, and we could just go fishing and camping there. So but that, we thought that was a great plan. So we, we parked our car. Again, I'm 20 years old. Um, not making great decisions at this point. We park the car. We uh, walk into the woods. We start setting up camp. So we set up camp. We get a campfire going. Um, we walk to the stream near us. Um, we took some adult beverages that we had taken along with us, and we were drinking those underage, of course, and uh, catching fish. And we had fish on the shore. 
And, um, and along comes a Vermont State Trooper. And he comes and says, hey, guys, what, what are you guys doing here? And we kind of like, oh, well, we're, we're camping and fishing. And he's like, um, well, this is not a campground. This is a private property that you're camping on. And so you're camping on private property. You're actually, you can't have open fires here either. So I saw a campfire going at your, uh, your campsite there. And um, do you guys happen to have a fishing license? And I was like, no, no license. Um, how old are you guys? Can I see your ID? Because uh, we had open containers of beer at the time. So he's like, here's what I'm going to do. I could cite you for um, fishing without a license, and I could cite you for uh, trespassing on private property and uh, being a minor in possession of alcohol and having an open container and any number of other things that I, that, that I could, could cite you for. And it would there would be some pretty big fines and you might actually have some jail time. Or how about this? How about you and your friends leave Vermont and never come back for the rest of your life? And so at 20 years old, and like honest to God, truth, I have never been back to Vermont. <laughs> I literally think there might be a list somewhere with my name on it and the name of my friends that like they'll check at the border. I'm not going to try it out. But that was like my really horrible fishing story. I tell it because it makes Eric feel better about his youth because he's not the only one that did things like that when he was young. But it's a fishing story, and we're going to actually tell a fishing story from the Scripture today. And it's a fishing story. Actually, last week, Eric taught on the end of Peter's kind of life and journey with Jesus. This is actually the very beginning of when, when Peter was called as a disciple, and Jesus talks about what, it, what does it mean to fish for people. So I'm going to read that to us out of Luke 5. This is Luke 5, 1 through 11. So hear God's word. One day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. And he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' feet and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. For he, he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. And then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. And hear this. This is what we're going to kind of focus on uh, for the next little while. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. We're going to think about that little phrase, what does it mean to fish for people? And this is a message about um, personal evangelism. What does it mean for our lives to be used by God to reach other people who are far from God? Um, this is God's plan. This is how he planned it all along. And uh, we're going to make the analogy of how fishing, how the act of like fishing for actual fish is very similar um, to what does it mean to fish for people or have a heart for evangelism. And so we're just kind of walk through that. And, and where we're going to end today is um, a strategy that each one of you will be able to take away from wherever you're hearing this message from to think about um, what it, how is my life um, being impacted by the gospel? How am I being used to reach others for the glory of God? Um, you'll never be able to, after today, think or say, I'm not sure how I would reach out into another person's life because I'm going to give you a very clear strategy to do that today. So um, the first way that fishing and evangelism are similar is that fishing requires going. 
Fishing requires going. It seems like really kind of straightforward, but the deal with fishing is the fish don't just jump into the boat, right? You have to choose to go out and choose to fish. And that sometimes we think as Christian people that it's not our job to kind of share the gospel or reach out into other people's lives. That's somehow maybe just the, the Christian professional's job, the missionaries, the pastors. But the scriptures are really clear that God uses everyday ordinary people as his tools to share God's good news in the world with the world. And you know, we can see this because Simon and James and John, these guys are just everyday ordinary people. Um, it says later in the book of Acts, after Jesus has resurrected and ascended into heaven, and they're kind of preaching the gospel, um, it says people just realized they were everyday ordinary men who had been with Jesus. And this is like our call as people who follow Jesus. It's our, our work to go fishing, to go fishing for people, to choose to do it. And, uh, and so I, I, for that's the first thing I want to kind of impress upon you because sometimes we think, you know, God's going to just reach people, but he doesn't need me to do that. But the way that God has always worked is he's used people to reach people for Christ. Uh, it's, it's his work to do the heart change, but it's our work to actually choose to go fish for people. And we see that in the disciples' lives because they watched how Jesus did it, and then he sent them out and said, now you do it, and we're going to talk about how you did it. And so this is kind of something that I think I want us to really think about, that fishing requires going. Um, the second way that fishing and evangelism are similar is you got to learn how. It requires learning how. Um, like, I don't know about you guys, but like if somebody had to teach you how to fish, right? For me, it was my dad. He taught me um, how the rod and reel worked, how to cast, how to like tie a uh, um, a knot to put the hook on, how to put the worm on the hook, how to put a bobber on it. That's how I learned originally was like a bobber and a hook and a, and a worm like a lot of people. Uh, for Peter and Simon, Simon Peter in this story and James and John, they would have learned a whole different way. It would have been casting nets and learning where the fish were. But we need to have a strategy and a plan for how it is that we go about evangelism. How do we go about fishing for people? So I'm going to kind of pause this one because we're going to get to that strategy at the end of the message today, but it requires learning how. Um, the third way that it's, this, that, that it's similar is it requires diligence. Um, you don't just kind of do it once or like say, you know what, I'm, I feel like doing it now, but I, I don't do it the rest of the time. If you really want to catch fish, you have to be diligent at it. You have to put work into it. You have to say, you know, I'm going to go... Um, in the morning, I'm going to get up early in the morning, I'm going to do it, I'm going to go in the evening, I've got a plan for how I'm going to fish and where the fish are. Um, right for me, I love to fish for bass. I know a lot about how, like, the, the behavior of bass and what, what lures they like to, to, to eat, you know, things like that. The same thing it goes for fishing for people, right? Like, you have to have a plan and a strategy, but you have to work your plan. You've got to you got to work at it. It doesn't just happen, right? And the, and the final way, and this is the most important way, is it depends upon providence. Um, when it's fishing for fish, we would probably say it depends on luck, right? Like the fish are in there and you got to have some luck for them to bite the hook. But when we're fishing for people, the word that we use is, is providence because this is understanding that, that God is at work in this whole process, that we're just a tool in his hand, and we're called to go out and share the gospel and the good news with people. We have to have a plan. We have to know how, how to do it. We have to be diligent at it. But Jesus is the one that does the, the transforming heart change and heart work. He's the one that actually makes the, the, the person get caught by the gospel, right? We can't make the catching happen but we can make the fishing happen, right? We can cast the nets and we can cast out, uh, everything out and hope and pray and trust that God's at work and he's going to work through us. So I said that I was going to share with you a strategy, um, a specific strategy for, for fishing for people. And that's what we're going to kind of talk about now. And if you're here um, at the message service where I'm preaching this now, I want you to grab um, your loop. If you didn't get a loop, um, raise your hand and someone will bring you one. 
Um, whatever venue you're listening to this message on now, I want you to do the same thing. Raise your hand and somebody will bring you a loop. And I want you to take some notes. On the back of the loop, you can see there's a place for notes. And on, along the left-hand side, I want you to write the word bless. B-L-E-S-S. -S. And this is going to be something that's going to help you. It's just a tool. It's a memory tool, right? When I was trying to memorize things in seminary or in school, I would use like these memory devices. So this, this B-L-E-S-S, -S, this acronym, is a way to be helpful to you to remember this device. Um, but I, it's more than just remembering it. I want you to write it down because this is something that I want you to take from here and I actually want you to put this into practice. Um, you know, in the book of James, it says, you know, um, if you look in the mirror and you immediately look away and you forget what you look like, that's like somebody who hears the word of God and doesn't put it into practice. Um, hearing something and then doing it is where a transformation happens. So this strategy is something I want to challenge you to do. And I've been thinking a lot about this in my own Christian life. It's like, how am I being used by God to reach people who are far from God in my own life? So I'm using this same strategy and putting it into practice as well. But if all 1,500 of us that, that worship every week at the Foundry put this into a practice and, and sought in a specific way to reach one, two, or three people each, um, can you imagine how we would grow? Right? This is our work together. And so um, this, the B-L-E-S-S, -S, write that in your notes, and we're going to start with B. The first is to begin with prayer. B is begin with prayer. And that's, that's kind of the first part of the strategy. Prayer being, so if your prayer has to first start with, God, give me a heart for people who are far from God. Maybe that's the prayer that you need to start with. It's like, God, right now, I don't have a burden for people who are separated from you. I don't think about them much. Maybe that's the prayer that you need to start with. But what I want to challenge you to is to start to begin to pray for one or two people. So think about one or two people that you could specifically begin to pray for. And these are people that you are already in relationship with. These are friends or coworkers. Maybe it's a neighbor that lives near you. Maybe it's a family member that you know is far from God. And these are people that you know either have no relationship with God at all, they've never said yes to Jesus, um, they haven't had that transforming experience, or maybe it's people that at one time had a vibrant connection with God but have been really disconnected from God because of something that happened in their life. So people who uh, don't yet know Jesus or are disconnected in any way, so one or two people that you begin to pray for and that you would diligently pray for them, right? We talked about fishing requires diligence. You wouldn't just pray for them once, that this would be part of your everyday prayer life, that you would say, God, um, give me a heart for this person. Would you, um, would you reach into this person's life? Would you draw them to yourself? Would you give me an opportunity to, to speak to them? Would you give me a heart to connect with them? Would you make an opportunity for me and our lives to overlap? So that's the first bit, is, is begin with prayer. Um, the second letter is the letter L, and that's to, to listen. To listen. Just listen as God gives you and opens up room for you to connect with that person or those few people. Start to listen to their hearts. Listen to them so that you know the places um, in their lives where they're wounded or hurt or where they're celebrating. Listening just means getting to really know that person and getting to understand exactly where they are and who they are. Um, if it's a neighbor, like for me, I'm, I'm just like being really honest with you. There's a, a couple and a family that live right across the street from me and I've started praying for them. They are people that it's hard for me to love because there's tension in our relationship sometimes. And, but I know that they are, they, they don't worship on, on Sunday or, 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 or any time. I don't see a lot of evidence of fruit of the Spirit in the way that they kind of talk to one another or their family. And for a long time, my heart was really hardened toward them, but I've started to pray for this family. 
And I'm, I'm asking now God to say, hey, ha- give me time to like really listen to them. So now I've got to actually have a conversation with them and not just avoid them and to kind of walk across the street and try to make conversation. And so you start to listen and really get to know people. The E is eat. And it's like, eat, what does that mean? Well, one of our core values at the Foundry Church is uh, the table. And so every time we gather, we try to eat together. But the reason that it's a value for us at the Foundry is because it was a value in in the scriptures. Uh, They ate around tables together, and they actually shared the communion meal together, and it was a way of understanding fellowship together. So taking that next step, going from praying for a person or a few people to really listening to them, but then inviting them into your life for a meal or going out to eat together or choosing to say, would you, would you come over and, and have a cookout with us? Or I, we'd love to take you and your family out to, to, to dinner. Um, this is not bringing them a meal. This is, this is having that connection of actually having a meal with them. And things start to change when we share life around tables together because it humanizes people, helps us understand who they really are, and we get to know each other in a deeper way. So begin with prayer, listen, eat. The first S is serve. Um, Look for ways as you've gotten to know through listening and eating and finding out what's going on in families, you can start to actually serve the people around you. And this is having, the, the reason that the, the acronym is BLESS is because our stance as Christians to the world should be to seek to bless them. The scriptures say they'll know we are Christians by our love. Um, that's the way that people will understand that something is different about us. So for me, I'm just thinking about my neighbor, right? Like if, if I start working this process with them, which I'm, I'm choosing to do and I'm committed to, I can maybe see places where they need help, right? I can maybe say, hey, you're going on vacation. Could I cut your grass while you're gone? Or, hey, would you, would you want me to um, bring you a meal maybe because you're, you're not, you know, I, I know that you're not feeling well. Or I could possibly do something with their kids, right? Um, I could start to have this posture of blessing and serving for this family. And then there's something that starts to change in the relationship, Right? Because when you're sacrificing and, and choosing self-sacrificing love for somebody near you, things start to change in that relationship. And so then the, the last S, and this is only after you've begun with prayer and listened and shared a meal together, ate together, and then served, only then after you've worked through that process relationally do you share your spiritual story. Only when God has kind of prepared the way for you to do that, right? Because now you've got a relationship and now you've got um, sort of fertile ground for saying, you know what, Um, let me tell you about um, who Jesus is to me and look for, and again, this can, can loop right back up to that B of beginning with prayer. Pray for an opportunity to do that. Say, God, would you open up a door or, or would you give me an opportunity where it wouldn't be weird or, or awkward in any way for me to share spiritually what's, what, what's happening in my life and what Christ has done for me? And some of you guys think, like, I don't know how I would do that. How would I share my story? Um, just a few kind of thoughts on that. Um, if you share from your perspective, nobody can ever refute what God has done in your life. A lot of people try to shut down um, like a logical defense of the scriptures or, you know, they say, where's the evidence of the resurrection or whatever. They, they, they kind of think scientifically like, I can't just get there. But if you kind of say, hey, this is how my life changed because of my relationship with Jesus. This is what my life was like before Jesus, before I really had a relationship with Christ. This is what happened for me to meet Christ. And then this is how things are different in my life since I came into relationship with Christ. Nobody can take that away from you, right? That's your story. It's transformational for you. And and just like me, like 28 years ago, um, when I wasn't walking closely with the Lord, I did silly stuff like camp on private property and fish without a license and drink beer underage and all the crazy things that I did when, when Christ wasn't 
sort of living and active in the center of me, but now I'm living a different kind of life because of Christ in me. And you can, I could share that story with my neighbor somehow, right? Um, and, and here's what I want you to think about, because we're going into the fall season, right? I want you to start thinking about um, the first thing I want you to do. You've written these things, B-L-E-S-S. I want you to take just a few seconds to think about who that one or two people is that you will write down at the top of your list. And, and if you know right now, the Holy Spirit might be bringing a person to your mind right now. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's a coworker. Maybe it's a friend. Um, I know who it is for me. For me, it's a family member. I've got a family member that is not following God very closely right now, and I want to pray for her. And I've got a, this neighbor across the street from me. Those are my two people that I'm going to be working through this process with. And uh, you can know that as a spiritual leader in this church, I'm doing this with you. Um, so I want to challenge us to think this way. If you're having a hard time thinking of who those people are, I'd say begin with a prayer about, about God, show me who, the, who that person is. Show me who you would use me to, to fish for people um, in, in my life. Um, and I, I believe strongly that the Lord is going to use this message and this time in the life of the Foundry Church to grow us, and, uh, and then we'll be careful to give God all the glory. Would you pray with me? God, we praise you and give you thanks that you love us enough to, to come and uh, be a rescuer to us. Jesus, we thank you that you are uh, the one that changes lives and transforms lives. And yet, Lord, you use people. You use Simon, and you said to Simon, from now on, Simon, you're going to fish for people. And, and Lord, that method of reaching people for your glory is, hasn't changed, God. It's the same today now as it was then. And so, Lord, we, we pray that you would use us. Lord, we begin by praying and saying, give us a heart, Lord, for lost people people that are far from you, God, that, 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 that don't yet have a relationship with, with you, that, that if they were to die, Lord, soon, they would, they would be separated from you forever. Lord, give us a burden for that. And Lord, I pray for each one hearing my voice now that you would, by the power of your Spirit, give them one or two names, that you would seek to use them to reach into, into their lives. Um, Lord, we thank you for the gift that is being able to be tools in your hand for your glory. And uh, Lord, we pray in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. So as you think about fishing for people, as you uh, think about that, that task, which is a huge task, um, know that the Lord goes with you. Know that he goes ahead of you. Uh, and hear these words as a closing benediction today. Not a him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we could ever ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace. Hey, we really hope that you got something out of this week's message. And if you want to get prepared for next week's, what you can do is you can click the link below in the description and that'll take you to our devotions page. We participate in devotions every week because that's part of our weekly rhythm here at the Foundry is being in God's word. Again, thanks for joining us and we hope to see you again next week.